Okay, why don't, why don't we get started? So welcome uh, to this week's installment of the Ethics Law and Society Forum. Um, uh, we're very privileged to have with us today two representatives from the Cordell Bank Marine Sanctuary, which as it sounds is a sanctuary uh, off of our coast, I guess once removed off of our coast. Um, and um, the title of their talk is Whale Aware, How Industry, Government, and NGOs are Working Together to Reduce Strikes to Whales by Large Boats. Um, on your left, you have Michael Carver, the Deputy Superintendent of the Sanctuary. He's the Resource Protection and Operations Coordinator, um, which includes overseeing and coordinating law enforcement, uh, permitting planning, um, and just generally addressing threats to uh, the marine environment, uh, in addition to a bunch of administra administrative roles like budget and um, contracts and just generally making sure the sanctuary runs. Uh, on your right is Jennifer Stock, who is the Education and Outreach Coordinator. She hosts educational workshops, puts together uh, materials for teachers and students, um, produces uh, publications, exhibits, signage, website. She's even uh, a DJ, right? Monthly? Is it a monthly radio show? Yes. Uh, called Ocean Currents on KWMR if you want to tune in sometime. Um, so please join me in welcoming Michael Carver and Jenny Stock. Thank you. So thanks for having us today. Um, I am going to introduce a little bit about this issue and set the scene of our region about the ocean here. And Michael is going to talk a little bit more about the actual issue of the ship strikes, having these large whales and large ships together. And we have a little video clip in between, so hopefully all our technology will work out. So just to get a little bit of a context, thinking about the ocean part of our world, our Earth is actually mostly ocean. About 75% of our planet Earth is in the ocean. So it's the dominant habitat on our planet. It really influences the way we live on land. It influences the weather. It makes this climate habitable. And when you look at a map like this that has all these arrows around the ocean, this is giving you an idea of currents and how water moves around the planet. It's all interconnected. But there's four really significantly biologically productive places on this planet that we have called eastern boundary currents. And these eastern boundary currents have a lot of cold, cold water. And a result of this cold water upwelling produces a lot, a lot of marine life meaning we have a span of marine life from the whales and the sharks, the seabirds, the tiny, tiny phytoplankton. So these four places have a huge, huge amount of biodiversity, somewhat signified by pictures like this. These are all animals within this region that we have right off the coast here, from incredible fisheries and habitats underwater to bringing big predators from across the Pacific Ocean here to eat on all this good food. Some things travel the entire Pacific Ocean to come here to eat because the food is so good. So we have sea turtles that come over from Indonesia, uh, sooty shearwaters from New Zealand, and other shearwaters from Chile, albatross from Hawaii. We have humpback whales that come up from Mexico and blue whales that come up from down at Costa Rica area. So all these things tell us that this is an amazing area off our coast. 1972 was an extremely significant year for environmental legislation in the United States, and a lot of different things were passed. Our country finally decided that clean water was of importance to us on land, and we have the Clean Water Act, which addressed issues relating to having water that was safe for drinking and for recreating in and for habitat um, passages for wildlife. Coastal Zone Management Act passed, which basically passed legislation looking at how we inhabit the coastline within 50 miles of the coast and how do we develop it and use the resources wisely, wisely there. DDT was banned in the United States, a very harmful uh, pesticide. The Marine Mammal Protection Act passed, which is when we finally stopped hunting marine mammals in United States waters. And the National Marine Sanctuaries Act was passed, which basically gave the authorization for our program to exist, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, which basically set aside some special places around the country that are so unique and biologically diverse or have some cultural maritime heritage story that we want to pr protect them for years to come. Very similar to national parks, but in the ocean. And so this is just a, a little map to show you where these places are. We're significantly smaller than the National Park Service, but we're growing. And these are all some special places in our country. So if you look closer here to California, we have four national marine sanctuaries out of 14 in the entire program right here. And this is another um, 
example of, sh of showing exactly how productive this region is. There's so much marine life here. We have areas that have been set aside to help protect them. So getting a little bit closer, right outside San Francisco Bay, we have the Monterey Bay, Gulf of the Farallones, and Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuaries. All the boundaries are different based on the politics of the time, the grassroots efforts at the time, and they were all designated at different times. And one of the main reasons each of these were established were to prevent oil and um, gas uh -huh. exploration or drilling in these areas. Right now, in a time when we're, as a country, looking at uh, getting energy more local as opposed to internationally, this is actually a really significant layer of protection for our coastline. And Californians love their coastline. So that's one of the main uh, barriers of protection the National Marine Sanctuaries offer, in addition to many other regulations to help protect these habitats for generations to come, including the fisheries in them that support us. So we have endangered whales that come here. Has anyone ever seen a humpback whale or a blue whale before? Excellent, a couple hands. These are massive whales. The humpbacks are about 50 feet in length, and hump, uh, the blue whales, that big one there, they get it to be 80 feet long. They're huge but they're not as quick as you think. And we have a bit of a conflict outside San Francisco Bay, not just here, but in other parts of California, with ships. Um, right outside the San Francisco Golden Gate, we have some of the most productive feeding areas in the world for these endangered whales, but we also have one of the most productive economies in the world, having ships that come across the Pacific to deliver our stuff to us in the port of Oakland. And so we're gonna focus a bit on the conflict that exists between these ships and having habitats where endangered species come and really depend on for their, their lifestyle. So what I'm gonna do is basically, we're gonna switch over to a short video clip here. It's about 10 minutes and it's from this film called Ocean Frontiers. You can look this up on the web, oceanfrontiers.org, made by Green Fire Productions. And this whole film is all about how ocean conservation People are working together with people that use the land and trying to figure out ways to work together, mainly through what we call marine spatial planning. And how do we use the ocean, but how do we conserve the ocean at the same time? And there's a specific um, chapter on here that focuses on this issue, but on the East Coast, over at Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, so <coughs> another national marine sanctuary. So we're going to put on our Atlantic hats for a second here. We're going to get away from San Francisco, but it's the same exact issue. And then Michael's going to talk a little bit about um, how we're working on this issue here. So I'm going to flip over here to the DVD. And maybe, do we have lights up here? We can. Uh, yes. I think it's just warming up. Hey, Josh, should I eject the DVD real quick? That would be smart, huh? Except I don't want to play the whole thing. I want the menu. Yeah, it might be Come on. <laughs> I think this would happen. It worked all perfectly a second ago. Yes, it did, didn't it? Um. <coughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Well, it worked. It just started up fine before. That was good. I guess it just doesn't hold and pause. <coughs> there we go. Thanks. the coast of Massachusetts, and it's an extremely productive area, one of the most productive areas in the Gulf of Maine. She might come up right here again. <coughs> you can just her forward a little. <coughs> Stellwagen Bank is a place of unusual richness, a mixing bowl of upwelling currents and nutrients that feed multitudes of fish and seabirds, marine mammals, and people. <coughs> When in 1992, Stellwagen Bank became a national marine sanctuary, 
it inherited a long and busy history of boat traffic. The sanctuary's waters are plied by all forms of vessels, and that has posed a growing challenge for the largest and oldest residents of Stellwagen. Well, the problem that we're trying to deal with in, in this particular piece is really North Atlantic right whales and humpback whales and finback whales, all these endangered species, being struck and killed by large commercial vessels. By that I mean uh, ships that are 300 gross tons or more. There's more and more cargo ships going in different directions from overseas and up and down the coastline. There's a lot of recreational uses, there's commercial uses. A lot of demand for wind power to be done out on the ocean. We now have two offshore uh, liquefied natural gas terminals off the coast of Boston. Knowing that some of the rarest whales in the world were dying in the shipping lanes of Boston Harbor, the Massachusetts Port Authority, Dave Wiley, and the shipping industry together set out to save them. The most immediate questions were simple to ask, yet hard to answer. <coughs> Where do the whales feed? Where do they congregate? <coughs> Where are the commercial ships traveling, and how fast? The answers eventually came by way of millions of little bits of data. <coughs> All the vessels, 300 gross ton or larger, are required to carry an AIS system or automatic identification system that was developed between us and the Coast Guard. And the way that we've done this is we've set up three antennas across the sanctuary, and the idea is that we can triangulate and get full coverage throughout the entire sanctuary. So what happens is the ship comes through the shipping lane or any other parts of the sanctuary. It transmits a signal every two to ten seconds, giving its ship information plus also its latitude, longitude, and speed, and where it's heading, and what type of vessel it is. Stellwagen's lab collected more than 150 million records each year, pinpointing all the large ships within the sanctuary. Determining the whale's whereabouts required different skills. Okay. If the other one is still on the left, you can go the flippers over the back there. Okay, you don't want to take the belly up one. You want to keep coming up, Alex, just like this. Just like this. Right, bang. Good place to wait till she brings her back up. You're right in the right spot. Let her, wait, let her bring it up. Let her bring it back up. Let her bring it back up now. Oh. To track the whales, Wiley and his crew employed a new device called a D-tag, a miniature computer harmlessly fastened to the whales with suction cups. When the tag detaches from the whale, a radio beacon leads scientists to its location to retrieve it. The D-tag has granted us a far more intimate picture of the whale's underwater world. This animation is based on the information gathered from the D-tag. Here we see the feeding behavior of humpback whales as it has rarely been seen before. But the D-tag allows us to get down to the bottom and see that, in fact, they are doing this sort of rolling behavior and feeding on what you're seeing here, which is the sand lance right along the bottom, um, sometimes during the day, mainly at night. And superimposed in here is some fixed fishing gear, which you'll see here is a gill net, and then also the surface lines going up to the uh, surface. So as you can see, this animal did a really good job avoiding um, the potential entanglement Other whales are not so lucky. North Atlantic right whales are found typically feeding near the surface, at a depth of 15 to 20 meters or less. 
15 meters is also the keel depth of large vessels entering the port of Boston, putting whales into strike range. With as few as 350 members of its kind remaining, the death of even a single breeding female can tip the species towards extinction. <coughs> so one of the next things we wanted to look at is uh, how serious of a problem is this? So another visualization here showing you, uh, again, the sanctuary is dropped into 3D here, and these are nautical mile uh, grid cells. And the height of the, um, each of the cells that you're seeing is, in fact, the dense areas where there's the most population of whales. Thompson and Wiley overlaid the shipping lanes and saw a collision waiting to happen. There were also areas in the sanctuary that were less used by whales. So he decided it'd be a good idea, very smart, uh, to try to move the shipping lanes from areas that whales used a lot to areas that the whales used with much less frequency. Wiley took his idea of moving the shipping lanes to the port operators group, presenting his data and offering solutions that were good for the whales. But were they good for the shippers? Our initial response to the, uh, the proposed shift in the, in the traffic lanes uh, was guarded, and then uh, we had some concerns uh, for navigational safety. It was the first time that you know, we'd ever been approached that, at that level, uh, in that detail, to figure out what was going on in the ocean. And you can't manage it if you don't know who's out there and what they're doing. With a clearer picture of all the pieces, both the shipping industry and the whale champions realized their needs were not so incompatible after all. They would have some more questions, we'd rework the data, and after about six months we came to an agreement of what we thought would be a particular um, configuration for the shipping lanes that would give us very good conservation benefit for right whales and the other endangered whales, and also would have minimal impact upon the shipping industry. The lane was shifted north, to come in a direction like this. This would represent what the new <coughs> shipping line looks like as opposed to the old one. I mean, there have not been any incidents, so. The last thing that we want to do is to, to harm one of the animals with the ship. And, and nobody wants to do that. The shippers don't want to do that. The pilots don't want to do that when they're on the ship. So we, we want to take the steps and we educate the, the captains and everybody involved so that that risk is, is reduced. Yeah. There's been close to 100% compliance with the ships following the, the uh, voluntary lanes, and I think that's testimony to how much the industry really embraced it. Boston became the first port in the nation to change its shipping routes to protect marine mammals, reducing the whale's risk of being struck by more than 80%. But there would be little time for celebration. Because at the same time we are moving. We're going to stop it there. And now Michael is going to come and talk a little bit about how we have approached this issue through the sanctuaries here. So about two years after this was going on on the East Coast in Stellwagen, uh, a pregnant female blue whale washed up on the ocean beach in 2010, and also uh, her aborted young. And, and that really kind of, you know, hit this issue home for us. We had to do something about it on the West Coast. Um, just to put it in perspective, half the stuff we buy from overseas comes into California ports, either into Los Angeles or the ports of San Francisco. So think of half the stuff we buy from Asia comes in through California ports. So we've got whales that are being struck and killed. We have something that's called a Sanctuary Advisory Council. This is made up of members of the public uh, from all different walks of life. They've got people from industry, people from the non-government community, from the environmental community, members of the public. And when there's an issue like this, we get together a working group, which is experts that try and help us solve it. And so what you're looking at here is a working group dealing with the issue of ship strikes and ocean noise. And we met for a year and a half 
And, and one of the things that I am proud of about this group is we had Greenpeace, um, Natural, Resource, Natural Resource Defense Council, Chevron, APL, you know, large industries and large environmental organizations sitting around the table trying to find a solution. So after about a year and a half, this group, um, and I'll just run through some of them here. Um, Lance Morgan is locally, he is a member of our SAC. He runs uh, Marine Conservation Institute. Um, these, you know, these are all fields that you guys could go into someday. Jackie Dragon now uh, helps run the West Coast Arm of Greenpeace. Um, you know, I, I could run, run through each of these careers, but you know, we've got whale researchers, uh, pe people from the Marine Mammal Center, head vets, uh, <laughs> industry representatives, and then people on the government side from the Coast Guard and, and sort of the safety navigation perspective. And so after a year and a half, we had come up with a lot of information that we needed. Um, you know, you heard Mike Thompson in a minute ago. He was the guy, the young guy speaking in that film who works at Stellwagen Bank. Um, Mike was very generous with his time and helped uh, sort of analyze the AIS, which is that automatic identification system data for us that's collected by the Coast Guard to help us better understand both ship behavior and then we also worked with our uh, marine biologists at uh, our sister agency to get all the ship strike information. What you're looking at here is the ship strikes over the last, you know, two or three decades. And if you just sort of take a step back, and I don't even go into the different species, you just generally notice there's an increasing trend. Well, I don't have to explain to you that generally we've been buying a lot more stuff over the last few decades from, from overseas. So there, that's sort of the one takeaway message from this slide. Ship strikes are increasing. Shipping is also increasing. This is a slide of shipping broken down into two sanctuaries. But generally, the most important takeaway in this slide <coughs> is that there's a lot of cargo traffic. That's that sort of big purple blue blob on there. You know, 50 or so percent of commercial traffic coming in as cargo ships. The reason we care about that population is because those boats are going very fast. They travel up to twice as fast as all the other traffic. What you're seeing here is the approximate speeds of that traffic. You know, it's going, depending on the lane, whether it's the northern lane, the southern lane, or the western lane, and whether it's going in or out of the port, it's generally going 16 or 17 knots. That's about 20 miles an hour. This is an overlay of that, what I was saying before, that automatic identification system data, of what it looks like coming out of the northern lane out of San Francisco, the western lane, and the southern lane. It sort of shotguns out that traffic once it leaves those lanes. That bright yellow showing that, that traffic, and then obviously the globe showing commercial traffic transiting all around our globe, moving all the stuff that we buy. That is our global economy right there. And the area that I'd like to point out, is there a pointer? Anyway, I'll just point. Right here is the shelf work. And if you heard Jenny saying earlier, that area is really of interest to us. So that dark black line that sort of walks up the coast, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of life uh, concentrates there to feed, and as you can see, there's a huge overlap of commercial traffic in that shelf break. So that overlap results in ship strikes, and it's not uncommon to have a boat come in with a little mustache, and that mustache being any number of the species of whales we have on this coast, which, you know, we have endangered blue whales, humpback whales, fin whales, gray whales, all of which show up uh, a lot in what's called the stranding database, and that's the database we keep track of all the animals that are uh, confirmed being uh, killed by ship strikes. Because just because the whale's in the bow, the commercial shipping companies might say, well, how do you know it wasn't dead when we hit it? Well, there are a few local heroes, and one of which who I really like to talk about is Frances Gulland at the Marine Mammal Center here in Sausalito. She is a world-renowned veterinarian, and she it does not hesitate to get her hands dirty. And, and these whales are never in a very convenient place to do uh, what's called a necropsy, which is an autopsy of a whale, to determine was it killed by a ship or was it killed by some other causes? So I should warn you, the next photo is pretty gruesome, so you can look away if you don't want to see gruesome photos. But this is how she figures out if the whale was, in, in fact, killed by a ship. This is blunt force trauma. We're mammals. We have hearts. When we're hit, when we're alive, the heart's still pumping. And so you get hemorrhaging. Hemorrhaging is when the blood is going into a wounded area, and it becomes quite filled or, or engulfed with blood. Francis does these necropsies. And that subcutaneous hemorrhaging is the definitive sign, along with giant cracked ribs, this animal was killed while it was alive. Okay, blood and guts is gone. 
so what you're looking at here, uh, thanks to Jenny for these uh, little uh, explanations at the bottom of these graphs, the takeaway message on the left is humpback whales and the right is blue whales. Generally since whaling ended, really uh, just before I was born, whaling stopped. The last commercial whaling station was in Richmond, in San Francisco Bay, which is kind of hard to fathom. So, you know, 70s, whaling stops. So these are animals which are, are quite long lived. And we see humpbacks, their populations are starting to go up, which is a good thing. You'd think we stopped killing them, they, they recover. Well, blue whales on the right, you're looking at three graphs from three different scientists, but generally the consensus is they're flatlined, they're not recovering. So this is a problem. And if you read the literature, it says that the, the number one threat to recovery is ship strikes. So this is just a hit home that you know, the, NOAA is out there, the sanctuary is out there collecting data on the exact area where these shipping lanes are. We've been doing this for over a decade. That's a research vessel on the left. Um, some of our, our research team mowing the lawn, as I like to say, counting everything, the birds and marine mammals, the krill. The krill is that little tiny thing on that woman's finger. That is what blue whales eat. That's what they're traveling across the Pacific here to eat. And it congregates along the shelf break I was talking to you about earlier. So there's Cordell Bank. If you ever go to Point Reyes and you stand at the lighthouse, it's just due west. And that area is teeming with life, and whales come there to feed. And if you remember from that first slide, ships also go right over that shelf break. So there's a problem. And the working group knew this, and they came out with this recommendation. They, you know, as Dave Wiley said in the film, it's not um, super novel. You want to decrease the co-occurrence of ships and whales. You don't want them in the same place at the same time. So on the left, you're looking at the old shipping lanes and sort of a generalization of the <coughs> traffic. And on the right, are the new shipping lanes, or the new recommended shipping lanes, I should say, at this point. And this is coming from this working group. So they wanted to narrow the lanes so when the, sh whales, when the ships go over that shelf break, they're going over in a very narrow band. So the red you're looking at in that picture is the preferred whale habitat. So that's generally where the whales are. And we know that from data. We know that from models. And so then it was just a matter of getting it done. And, and all this is summarized in this 50-page report that came out of it, because if you meet for a year and a half and you, you have literally the world's experts in a room, you want to write it all down. So it's in a report. It's online. You can read it if you want to. But the next step was to actually do it. So we did it. In 2013, we moved the shipping lanes. And it wasn't just us. We worked with the Coast Guard, the International Maritime Organization, which is under the United Nations. Um, it was a process for sure. It took a few years. But uh, we can now happily say that, that we have new lanes that reduce the risk uh, to whales. But just like, you know, I, I, Jenny was joking with me, one of my little talking points said, whales has tails, and she was like, what does that mean? And, and the point simply being that they don't always stay out of the lanes. They move around. You know, if the prey's in the lane, they're going to be there. So um, I forgot about this slide. This is just to let you know, it, would also, it was also done by our colleagues down in Channel Islands. They moved their lane about a mile, again, to decrease the overlap. So. You know, we don't want um, the whales in the lanes, but sometimes they're going to end up in the lanes. And so the thought is school zones. You guys have all driven through a school zone. Sometimes kids are present, sometimes they're not there. So at some point, you have to, somebody has to flick on the sign that says, please drive 10 miles an hour or 15 or whatever they're saying. So the idea is, how do we do that here? How do we set up school zones? Do we go out there and count whales every day? Well, our ship captain was like, I think that'd be a great idea. You should come out here every day and I should drive the lane and we should count, lane, count whales. And we're like, no, that's not going to happen. We can't, we can't be out there every day. So you guys are of the age of the internet, of the age of apps and smartphones and everything else. Crowdsourcing is, is the idea we're trying. And so the idea is to get an app into the hands of all the mariners. And I say all the mariners because in the top there, you're looking at the pilot boats. Next one down, you've got a uh, commercial charter boat, people want to go whale watching or, or commercial fishing. You've got the Coast Guard there and their helicopter. You've got our research boat. You've got commercial mariners. So if all these people could start reporting when they see whales with this new app that we wrote with the app developers, then maybe we could start to get a sense of where the whales are. So here's the, just a quick screen grab of the app. It always makes me smile when I see the new lanes because they're the new lanes. So the idea is somebody breaks out their phone when they see a whale, and, and records its location. So here's the area that we cover with our research boat. This is great. We have incredible coverage, um, but we're only out there three times a year. We just, we literally don't have the funding to do, to mow the lawn every day. So 
then we've got people who are out there every day. On the Farallon Islands, there are biologists who live there year round. Those biologists go up to the lighthouse every day and take this app and enter data for us and let us know what they see. But they can only see out so far. And just recently, we started working with the docents at Point Reyes, who are also out at the lighthouse at Point Reyes, and they're using the app. And they're entering data all winter long. So that's really good. And then we potentially, we might be able to work something out in Bodega and Half Moon Bay. So then we've got the whale watching companies. Generally, these are the areas where they go, and you've got a few people who are early adopters who uh, have started to use the app, and this is sort of the data that's coming in from them. We just launched the app, by the way, about a month ago. Then we've got the Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard is great because they basically will fly the exact shipping lanes, which is where we really care about where the data is. So if we get a lot of reports, and I like to call the crowdsource data kind of like a Twitter feed, maybe not the most reliable, but it's real time. And so if we get a Twitter feed of data from the app which says, hey, we've got an aggregation of whales in the lane, or maybe somebody was messing with us, maybe they aren't there, for whatever reason they decided it'd be fun to save five blue whales in the lane, I can go up in that helicopter, I can fly with the Coast Guard, we can fly the lanes and verify the data. And here's um, the uh, screen grab of the data. So if you go to whalealert.org, you can actually see it, and you'll see all the data from the islands. They've been very religiously entering data. You'll see some of the whale watch operators who go in and out of the bay and the mariners, some folks who are up on Cordell Bank. And this, this gives me hope. This says maybe this will work. You know, I, I hope I can be back here in two years and talk to you guys and say crowdsourcing works. You know, this whole map will be speckled with dots, and it'll all be from the maritime community, and then we can set up those school zones. And those school zones are really simple. They're just asking mariners to either slow down, or if they want, if there's no whale, say, in the southern lane, go as fast as you want. Um, the other option is to ask traffic to slow down for months at a time. And that's what they do on the East Coast on some of the ports. They have seasonal management areas. But the commercial shipping companies, they don't want to slow down. They really want to get you your new shirt or whatever they're bringing in from Asia. And, uh, and, and time is money. If they miss a shift of the people that are called longshoremen who offload those containers from those ships, uh, it is hundreds of thousands of dollars that they lose uh, because they lose their place in line and they have to get back in line. So it's, I can't express to you enough how much these companies really want to get there. So that's why we're trying to be fine-tuned and only have the, the slowdown happen when there are whales in the area. So we're not there yet. Uh, we do have new lanes, and uh, we're hoping um, that next year we can get to the point where we can um, set up these what are called dynamic management areas with confidence. So. Yeah. yeah. And if you ever go whale watching, <coughs> I would encourage you, I should say this, to go, to go to the App Store on your Android we'll be releasing in another month, or iTunes. Download Whale Alert, and when you're out there, just pull it out and go, I see a whale. And it, it really is. It's that simple. It's, it's all those observations, and there's a little ID guide in there, so if you don't know if it's a blue whale or a humpback whale, and there isn't a naturalist on the boat who can help you, um, there's a little guide there that will help you uh, let us know what it is. So I just want to wrap up, and we can definitely take some questions, but the, one of the reasons I think we're invited here is that we work for helping to protect ocean marine life, but as you can tell, it's very complex to manage marine life to allow it to be sustained and to thrive when we also inhabit the earth as humans. And there's a lot of challenges that come together of trying to protect these things, but also knowing that we have a global economy and sometimes these things overlap. And so there's a lot of, you can tell just from all the things Michael talked about, a lot of people doing a lot of different types of things, either whether it be in science or government, or law, or industry, trying to figure out how to do the right thing. And that's generally what it comes down to. And I think Michael talked about this as well, and that we don't have the perfect answer yet, but we're moving in the right direction by working all together. And you can't just say, this is the law, and this is what's going to happen now, because that doesn't benefit everybody. Yeah, the compliance that people have gotten with sort of unless you come out with a, a regulation, yeah, and even when you do on the East Coast from the shipping companies, they'll just pay the fine. And so it was really important to get the sort of buy-in, to have them sit around the table, to have the pizza, the beer, the, what it took, the late nights, to say, yes, okay, we're willing to do this. Because at the end of the day, you know, they didn't get into this career as a commercial, you know, as a pilot or a captain. They don't want to run over whales. Like, nobody, I mean, you know, talk about, I don't know if anybody's, has anybody hit any animal in their car? He wants to admit it. <laughs> I have. I ran into a deer. Jenny saw it. 
you know, it, nobody wants to do it, but it happens. And, and so, you know, it was really critical to get the companies there at really the highest level to commit, hey, we're willing to do this. You guys um, come out with these measures. We'll try and help you collect the data. Um, and, and it is really, I think, the better way is when you have that buy-in opposed to just coming out with a law, you will do this. And that, you know, that is the other thing we have behind our back is they know as the federal government, we, you know, we do have a hammer behind our back, which are laws, and we can go that way. But we're hoping we don't have to. So let's take some questions. We got plenty of time. Hope you have some. Uh, yeah. I had a question about uh, going back to like the school zones. Um, are yeah. you would a solution be to are you looking to penalize them like uh, like as you would an like, uh, officer pulling someone over for speeding? Totally. Yes. So <coughs> the idea is that initially uh, we do it voluntarily, and on the East Coast, if they were to break a rule like that, the fines are ninety, a hundred thousand dollars. So they're not in insignificant. Um, but they're commensurate with sort of the seriousness. Um, but we're hoping we can do this voluntarily. So, yeah. Yeah. So you said that you're making an app, like you're making it available for everything. Yep. I think that's a great idea because like, I kayak all the time and I see whales. So on the app, can you say like where it's going? Yeah, so on the app right now, um, you will see yourself on a NOAA chart. And you'll see where you are, which is a function that a lot of people who go out on the water love. They're just, you know, they love sort of seeing their position, and they can sort of record their track. Um, but you won't see the animals in real time. We have a concern, and I was just in Cape Cod four days ago with Dave Wiley and Mike Thompson from the film wrestling with this very issue because we released this nationally. And some ports, there's a lot of pressure on the in the whale watching community. You know, there's literally hundreds of boats would, would rush after a whale. In other ports, you don't have that issue of what we call harassment. And so we're trying to figure out how to give people the data in real enough time that it is a positive feedback that engages them, that they go, oh, hey, there's my sighting. And so then they use it again. Um, but we also don't want to cause an issue of harassment. And so we spent a few days wrestling over that. And I think what we came to is that we will probably do it, uh, it'll vary by port and by region. So we'll, we'll block it up. And some ports, the data will be delayed uh, by months. And others, it'll be in near real time. Sorry, that was kind of a longer answer. But it's a, it's, I, yeah, it's a, it's a big issue for us. And we're really struggling with it uh, on what to do. Uh, I'm going to add to that. Actually, yeah. there is a lot of issues of harassment, especially here on the West Coast. Uh, you guys have probably all seen, maybe, down in Monterey Bay this year, humpback whales were less than a mile from the Moss Landing Beach for about two months just feeding and feeding and feeding in less than 100 feet of water. And people were paddle boarding out to the whales and kayaking out to the whales. And first of all, that's against the law. You're not supposed to approach whales. Second of all, these people are going to get hurt really badly. These are massive animals. Yeah. And so that's a real significant issue, especially with the fact that we never know where the food's going to be, where the, food, where the animals are going to be. The food is moving all the time, minute to minute, day to day. And so it's very hard to know. So people that are out looking for adventure and thrill and GoPro cameras and stuff like that, um, that would be really interesting information for them to have. So yeah, that's another important piece of that. For sure. Um, so you're saying you're not looking into the law just yet. Right. Um, so if in your day-to-day, -day, people go listen to you, you could obviously increase things to like the whales. So if it were to become a law, how would, like, how would you take care of it? Would you we would. And like, how would you know which boat goes with whale and which company and all that kind of stuff? It is. It's, it's tricky. During the working group, twice actually, a, a boat from one of the companies represented on the panel came in with a whale on the bow. And later, uh, that whale washed onto the beach. Francis Gulland, who you saw on the slide, did a necropsy, confirmed it was ship struck. And so it's happening with fair, a fair amount of regularity. Um, so that's how we know the animal was struck. But the violation would be done just on them breaking the speed limit. They wouldn't even necessarily have to hit the whale to receive the fine. Uh, and we have different kinds of fines um, in our organization. At the federal level, we can, uh, they're called summary settlement. And what that means is this violation equals this fine. It's just signed, sealed, and delivered. You know, you go and drive your jet ski where you're not supposed to, $250. Or you do this, and in this case, these fines are um, sort of, uh, they're significant. And you know. do you guys know, like, where, not they hang out, but, like, where the majority of the whale population is? And so is that, like, part of the movie that you said you're blocking it off and you're saying that the boats can't come 
Exactly. If you go back to this slide right here, you'll see the red being generally where the whales are feeding, which pretty much follows the shelf break. And you'll see the overlap of where traffic used to go on the left, which is sort of that gray giant swath. I like to use a shotgun analogy because it sort of it, it explains how lethal uh, it can be. And on the right, it's sort of a fine-tuned uh, path that, that cuts through the feeding grounds. So, um, but it's still cutting through the feeding grounds. So it's, you know, the, the slowdowns are really focused on that, that overlap. And the reality is that they're here for periods of time, and, and it really shifts. You know, it's, uh, we've been monitoring just this area now 11 years, and still we aren't able to predict exactly where they'll be this year. So that's where the crowdsourcing really comes in. Yeah, you in the back. Just like how we have laws now involving cars that have that <coughs> standard safety equipment to protect the passengers inside and people outside the vehicle. Right. Could there not be a solution to retrofit boats so that you can say, <clears throat> I'm a boatsman, I'm coming through a port, I'm following all your rules and regulations, right. I'm going to speed limit or under. Totally. I, for whatever reason, I don't see there's a small whale that's barely crossing the water and I strike him. Right. Could the boat be fortified in such a way that maybe perhaps Whale would die or even be severely damaged and just simply be injured to the degree in which a cooper recover and still live its life as if that incident didn't happen or with the least money. You, you're right on. The slide I deleted from this presentation was one which is called lethality curve. And it basically shows that if you're going five knots and you hit a whale, chances are it'll be fine, it'll swim swim away. Uh, if you go up towards twenty knots, it's basically guaranteed it's going to be dead. And somewhere in the middle ground, around 10 knots, the curve goes from this really steep climb, which is this is sort of guaranteed to be dead, to eh, probably going to be OK. And this part right here is about 10 knots. And so if they slow down to 10 knots, chances are Willie will be on its way. Um, but it's so, so re really, that is the responsible behavior. And that's what we're trying to get to. You know, and I think that's what, where they came down to 15 miles an hour in a school zone. Chances are the little kid can like, you know, <laughs> get out of the way. So, but, but they have, have looked at. Maybe. Maybe. Um, we have looked at other sort of active things like um, noisemakers on the front of boats, uh, like little, you know, little deer whistles, but something a bit more active uh, to try and deter them. Um, but to date, they, we haven't found anything too successful uh, that's also not a huge harassment. Uh, there, you know, I mean, we, we, we do know of some technologies which could clear the area, but uh, at that point, you're also stopping them from feeding. So it's sort of this uh, fine line. But, but yeah. Bumpers? Yeah, exactly. I mean, just for instance, cars now, years ago, big giant chrome bumpers. That's not a great idea. Right. Now, these classic bumpers, you know, yeah. from all ages, crumbles. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Regarding double hulls for uh, stopping them from leaking oil and things, but I've never heard anybody talk about literally bumpers. Um, but I, I, I won't forget it because I'm, in, I'm engaged with the people that work at the IML level on uh, ship design uh, from the industry. I talked to them and they were on this working group. And uh, so. It could be a cheap, low grade way to solve the problem, but the technology and other stuff that has huge fine regulations. Hey, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. How much, um, how much resistance do you meet with, I know people cooperate and change the shipping lanes, but how difficult does it become to get uh, companies and groups to change practices that they've been doing for a long time? Do you mean to go to the new lanes? Or? New lanes or, or, or yeah. really the, anything? The new lanes are a snap, and I'll tell you why, and that is because their insurance companies insure them if they're in the lanes. If they're not in the lanes, <laughs> we may insure you, but we may not. So they're very motivated to stay in the lanes. As far as slowing down, I think, um, I haven't talked to any insurance companies, but I think a lot of it just comes down to dollar and cents. Dollar, cents, and PR. And so the PR is horrible. They don't want the PR. And, I, and honestly, I really, truly don't think their crew wants to do it either. So I think if they can slow down and they can kind of work it in their matrix of sort of arrival and you know, their giant you know, grid of when I'm supposed to be there, then I think they will do it. And my colleague in Southern California at uh, Channel Islands, Sean Hastings, is paying them right now, working with a few companies, got some funds from a, uh, an organization to pay the companies to slow down voluntarily. 
And so, and, and many of them are doing it. So I think what it's doing is it's helping them, it's incentivizing them, it's saying, okay, this isn't sustainable long term, but we're willing to pay you to go the eff extra effort to try and redo your schedule to say, hey, can you make this work for you? Um, and we're finding they're doing it. So. I want to add one piece yeah. to that. We were just talking about Channel Islands and that, that they're paying, they have a small set of funds to pay companies to slow down. It's actually through the California Air Quality Resource Board because the ships that go slower produce less air pollution. And so it's actually that whole <coughs> effort is being funded by air pollution funds. Thank you. Because yeah. ships that slow down have less pollution. So there's a double benefit here for slowing down these traffic, the, the ships. It's not just for the whales, it's also for our air quality. So it's kind of an interesting study to see how they're going to comply and not very sustainable, though, because of the, the money involved. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. About, like, how often are they struck? Like, would you say it's very frequent? It really depends on the year and the, and the species. Um, and some of them we don't even know. They, they have a formula for how many wash ashore and are seen and how many are hit out at sea and sink. Um, so I think John Cal, the kid, is, uh, estimates, like, yeah, it's fivefold yeah. of whales we don't even see that have been hit by ships. That's a hard. That's the whole part of this. Is like, the ocean is so big. Yeah, it's an order of magnitude. And one of the ways he came to that was the Navy uh, and other DoD folks are mandated to report when they strike an animal. So we looked at that number that we see of struck whales versus what we see in the stranding database, which are the ones that washed up at the beach or the commercial mariners report. And we went, wow, there's an order of magnitude difference in these two. Um, why? Oh, wait a minute. Maybe we're not seeing them all on the beach. Maybe they don't make it. And then also studies knowing that some animals sink, um, they, they don't bloat and, and things like that. Uh, but to answer your question is how many per year? We could go a year and have no blue whales. We could go a year and have four. Um, but there's something called the PBR, not the beer. It's a potential biological removal, and that is the number of animals that can be taken out of a population before it goes downhill. And for blue whales, that's 3.1. So. If some years we know we have three or four, we've really got a problem because chances are the number is much higher. So wasn't it one summer in Channel Islands? It was three whales. Yeah, it one, one sum summer. Yeah, low, right. Yeah, we had an unusual mortality event for blue whales, uh, where they had three blue whales killed. Generally, every year we get a number of gray whales, a number of humpback whales. Maybe you know you get a fin whale, a blue whale, a humpback whale, um, but not usually all of the same species. I don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah, I'm from, I haven't looked at age uh, diversity in the data. Um, generally, I'm just looking at struck versus unstruck. Um, but mental note, I'm gonna, I'll find the answer. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah. Um, is there a way to treat the ships with non-perishable goods differently as far as like, the speed limit? Goes? Yeah, unfortunately, We've talked a lot about that, and the way the whole industry works is container ships are full of a whole smattering of goods because there are a subset of companies that are willing to, they're not in a huge hurry, maybe Patagonia or you know, some corporations which might be willing to do green shipping, uh, but that would require a whole paradigm shift in how it works. But those conversations are definitely happening because there are some lines that are doing what's called slow steaming. They're saying across the board, we're just going to be slow across the Pacific, less air quality issues, less marine mammal encounters, so. <coughs> okay, thank you very much.